Hi, my name is Neha Mantha Shah and I'm from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and it's my pleasure to talk to you um, about rare T cell lymphomas. I greatly appreciate the LRF's opportunity, giving me the opportunity to talk about this important topic. Uh, but I also acknowledge that this is an often very rare disease, uh, by definition, a group of very rare diseases. And some of you may have questions about um, your particular situations and feel free to put those into the chat. I want to give you a broad overview of, of some of these diseases as well as um, some of the work that's going on in those arenas and, and what you can do to help. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, so T-cell lymphomas, as you may know, uh, represent a subset of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. There are about 7,000 to 10,000 cases of T-cell lymphomas per year. And all of these make up only 7% of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And to make things even more complicated is that the term T-cell lymphomas reflects so many different diseases, um, over, over 25 or so. And so um, when you use that term T-cell lymphomas, really you're talking about a hodgepodge of different diseases, some being more common than others. About half of T-cell lymphomas are systemic or throughout the body, and others are what we call primary cutaneous or present in the skin um, as their uh, predominant manifestation. And overall, as you can see, and these are highlighted, um, that um, the more common types are peripheral T-cell lymphoma NOS or angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma and a disease called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. But some of the diseases that we're going to talk about today, like um, enteropathy-associated T-cell lymphoma, hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, subcutaneous paniculitis-like T-cell lymphoma, and KT-cell lymphomas make up somewhere between less than 1% to 5% of even T-cell lymphoma cases, making them exceedingly rare. Um, and so I, the, um, the, sometimes we think of these are of the, um, most common of these relatively rare diseases, um, as, as, uh, being peripheral T-cell lymphoma, NOS, angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma, or anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which usually present in the lymph nodes. Uh, there are, um, other diseases that present predominantly in the blood, or we call these leukemic, and then, um, in the other sites of the body, like, extranodal or outside of the lymph nodes, and then those that present predominantly in the skin, which are most commonly mycosis, fungoides, and cesare syndrome. And then we go to the less common diseases, which again, there's a hodgepodge of these, but these can include um, disease in the blood like T-cell LGL, um, can include a disease called acute T-cell lymphoma leukemia that we'll talk about today that's associated with the virus, HTLV. Um, and KT cell lymphomas, enteropathy associated lymphomas, including enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma and monomorphic epithelial trophic intestinal T cell lymphoma, affectionately called needle, um, as well as some other uh, lymphomas in the skin that tend to tend to be called CD30 positive lymphoproliferative disorders. So these are those somewhat less common, meaning that um, doctors um, who practice in lymphoma um, likely see these diseases in a, maybe a few cases per year. Um, and then patient doctors in the community may not ever see these diseases. And then there's the even more rare diseases. Um, and some of these include something called hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma that we'll talk about today, as well as subcutaneous paniculitis-like T-cell lymphoma or primary cutaneous gamma delta T-cell lymphoma that tend to be in the skin. So today we're just gonna focus on a few of these rare diseases. Um, and I apologize, we haven't covered something that you were particularly interested in. These include acute T-cell lymphoma leukemia, which is associated with the virus HTLV, um, hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, enteropathy associated T-cell lymphoma called EDL, um, monomorphic enterop enteropathic intestinal uh, T-cell lymphoma called needle, uh, subcutaneous paniculitis-like T-cell lymphoma, also called SPTCL, and then uh, primary cutaneous gamma delta T-cell lymphoma and NK T-cell lymphomas. And hopefully, um, hopefully it'll help you make sense of these um, kind of long words. Um, so what makes rare diseases particularly difficult? I think um, there, there's a reason why these have gotten these diseases have all gotten separate separated out from the general category of T cell lymphomas, and it's because we know that they have different clinical presentations. Um, they act differently in people. They, uh, we're learning more and more that these have different disease biologies, both at the genetic or molecular level. Um, but that makes it 
difficult um, and they're sometimes difficult to diagnose as a result. Um, they often require the, the help of an expert hematopathologist. Um, and some of these diseases are mistaken for being inflammation or infection before people realize that they're really a sign of a cancer like lymphoma. And many of these require not only the uh, input of the pathologist, to make the diagnosis, but also the clinical picture is part of making the diagnosis. We call that a clinical pathologic entities, where the clinical impression as well as what it looks like under the microscope are equally important in making the diagnosis. As a result of these being rare, most centers across this country only see a handful of cases of these per year, even some of the biggest lymphoma centers. And so at an individual center, there's less experience. And most of the data that we have is from pooled experiences across um, different centers across the country, which means that um, which means that in a, in a community hospital or, um, or community oncology practice, those doctors may or may not have ever seen cases of this. Or, um, and given that they're so rare, um, knowledge about them is very limited. Um, as a result of that, as you can imagine, doing a clinical stu study specific to um, these very rare diseases can be very hard and very costly. They they involve doing um, they involve doing uh, studies across many many institutions, um, and um, that can be difficult um, and and um, and difficult to execute as well as extremely costly. Um, and therefore, the treatment approaches have largely been guided by people's experiences and pooled experiences and expert experiences rather than rigorous prospective clinical trials, which we would love to do, um, but would be very difficult to do in these patient populations. So when we think, when we try to teach our fellows about um, or residents about, you know, how to approach people who have this, we think about the ones where you can give um, therapy similar to uh, other T cell lymphomas and where we really have to think differently. And so um, the many frontline uh, patients who have T cell lymphomas, uh, when they're initially diagnosed or treated for curative intent with chemotherapy that's based on a regimen called CHOP. And in enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma or monomorphic epitheliotropic intestinal T cell lymphoma medial or acute T cell lymphoma leukemia, uh, regimens that are based on CHOP um, may be reasonable um, for the treatment. Um, the, um, there are other diseases where we know that the CHOP chemotherapy really doesn't work that well, and, and um, other therapies may work better, and those include extranodal NK T cell lymphomas or hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. Um, and so um, to, to, that's imp an important designation and an important disease to identify or diagnose early on because it would change your initial treatment. And then um, with other diseases, there's very, very limited data about what the frontline therapy is. And we'll talk about um, those, but for the most part, we don't, we don't always use CHOP for those either. So we're gonna start by talking about acute T-cell lymphoma leukemia, which is called ATLL. Um, it, it's associated with the virus HTLV. HTLV is one of the retroviruses, like um, HIV is another example of a retrovirus. It's endemic to certain areas of the world, and this is a map of, um, courtesy of Dr. Horowitz, of um, where there are hot, hot pockets or higher proportions of patients who have HTLV. Um, in places like Japan or the Caribbean or some sections of Western Africa, um, HTLV occurs is present in more than 5% of the population, which is considered to be very, very high. Um, in those other areas in orange, it happens in one to 5% of the population. And in the areas in yellow, um, it's less than 1% of the population. Um, HTLV care, um, is transmitted maternal fetally. So it can be transmitted through breastfeeding, through the process of giving birth, um, as well as through the blood or other, um, or other um, human secretions. Um, so it can be sexually transmitted as well. Um, the, um, but we know that only a very small fraction of people who carry this virus ends up developing the lymphoma or the leukemia from it. Only two to 4% of the carriers can develop the actual disease and it takes decades to manifest. So um, from being very, very, at very, very low levels to developing higher levels of HTLV as well as the development of lymphoma or leukemia, it can take many decades. Um, we think of people who have ATLL in a few subgroups. Um, so two of these subgroups are slower growing. We call these either chronic or smoldering. And then there are people who have it faster growing. Um, and um, we call that either the acute presentation or the lymphoma presentation. 
And so in the indolent or slow growing ones like chronic or smoldering presentations of this disease, the treatment goal is to suppress the disease and to uh, maintain the disease. And um, so sometimes you could consider observation um, pretty rarely, but sometimes that can be possible. Um, you can use medicines like antivirals and interferon. Um, and then there are thoughts about using other single agent medicines like an antibody medicine called mogamulizumab against CCR4 or lenalidomide, which is a pill immunomodulatory medicine, um, as well as investigational treatments. For the faster growing uh, lymphoma, the acute type or the lymphomatous type, um, the treatment purpose is curative. We give combination chemotherapy. We most often give an infusional chop based regimen called EPOC, uh, but there are many variations of this. Um, and then we consider giving chemotherapy uh, followed by a donor bone marrow transplant. And that's because we know that those are the patients who tend to do best, um, is, are the patients who make it to a transplant. For patients who are not quite so sick at the time of diagnosis, people can use interferons and antivirals uh, as well. And for patients for whom they're not cured with their initial treatment, we consider other therapies. Um, recently, there's been a, a, a development of a few newer therapies for ATLL. Um, that includes lenalidomide um, as a single agent, um, bogamulizumab, the CCR4 antibody, which is also approved in cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And in Japan, um, they recently had developed a, a pill medicine called an EZH2 inhibitor, um, also for um, ATLL. And, um, and so those are therapies that can be considered. Now, moving on to a different, totally different disease called subcutaneous paniculitis T-cell lymphoma. So this is a lymphoma that occurs in the skin, under in the fat that's underneath the skin. So if patients feel like they have bumps underneath the skin. They don't always show up with a rash. They may have some mild discoloration or bumps that you can see here, areas of healing. Um, they can be painful or uncomfortable, especially when they pop up. And in this subcutaneous fat area, this is the top of the skin, and this is the fat area underneath the skin, you have this proliferation or increased number of these lymph, abnormal lymph cells that are rimming the fat lobules. And um, so we call that paniculitis or paniculitis is, is um, uh, inflammation or in the fat um, areas. Um, and these patients can show up with these um, areas being quite active um, and taking up substantially more sugar than the rest of the body, or we call that FDG active um, or have FDG avidity on a PET scan. So here you can see a patient who had um, spots underneath the, the skin and these slides are courtesy of Dr. Horowitz as well. Um, and so there, um, as you can imagine, this can be a subtle thing to notice. Um, patients may be told that they have other inflammation. There are other autoimmune diseases that mimic the same presentation that can show up with paniculitis as well. Or in the setting of an infection, you can see paniculitis, and those things are much more common than this disease. Um, these nodules can come and go um, or in the beginning, especially as well, making it also harder to diagnose. Um, and the biopsies that are usually done by dermatologists are usually done superficially. So they're not usually all the way deep into the fat where the disease is. And so sometimes the disease can be hard to um, diagnose because the biopsy is just not quite deep enough um, to make the diagnosis. These are um, treatable but not curable diseases. We usually will therefore treat with milder therapies um, to keep it under control. Um, those could include medicines like uh, bexerotene or medicines like methotrexate, uh, which are oral pill medicines. People have used a, a medicine called cyclosporin as well um, in the treatment of this disease. And um, patients can do very well with these. Um, overall, and they can stay on pretty mild therapy um, without much progression into other therapies. But there are times where we end up reaching for more intensive therapies. Uh, one of those situations is if patients have um, a development of a hyperinflammation system in their system, which causes HLH or hemophagocytic lymphocytosis. Basically, the, um, the garbage eating cells, the macrophages in the body, um, start to get overactivated and, and they also overact other immune cells. And these immune cells are then gobbling up the normal cells, causing low blood counts and fevers um, and abnormal liver enzymes. And if that's the case, then sometimes more intensive therapy is needed. Um, and there is a different disease that we'll get to in a little bit that can be mistaken for subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma. And it's important to distinguish between the two because that disease is treated very differently.
Um, now moving on again to a totally different subject, enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma or EDL, and then monomorphic epitheliotopic intestinal T cell lymphoma called medial. Um, the EDL and medial um, rhyme, but they're also lymphomas of the GI tract. Um, these, this is a picture of someone of the GI tract. This is courtesy of Dr. Dogan and Dr. Horowitz, where you can see that at the top, um, this is the lining of the GI tract. So you see these areas of lymphoma or like um, inflammation cells all scattered in here. And, and this is a PET scan of one of Dr. Horowitz's patients where you can see that there's a lot of information in this bowel area uh, of that patient. Um, EDL and METL were once grouped together. They were recently um, separated in our classification system. For a while, we called them EDL type 1 and EDL type 2. EDL type 2 is now called METL um, to prevent confusion. E EDL, a classic EDL, um, is associated with celiac disease. Um, it occurs in up to 1% of 1 to 2% of patients who have celiac disease. It's a pretty rare complication. It tends to be associated with people who have specific phenotypes of celiac disease. And people who have what we call refractory celiac disease are at the highest risk. So run-of-the-mill celiac disease that responds to um, holding gluten usually doesn't develop into um, EDL, fortunately. Um, these patients can notice they have inflammation in the small intestine, they can have narrowing or uh, of the small intestine, they can develop masses or ulcerations within the small intestine, um, or they can rarely, those ulcerations lead to openings of the small intestine or perforation, um, and, and that can be, um, those are some of the presentations that patients will come to us with. Um, type 2 EDL or METL, um, now called METL, is much less common. It's only about a tenth of these enteropathy-associated cases. It's more common in Asia. It occurs relatively sporadically um, and mostly involves the small intestine, but can involve the large intestine as well. The um, um, the treatment of EDL and METL usually is chemotherapy-based. Um, some patients end up having a mass that requires them to go to surgery before they start um, a treatment or in the process of the diagnosis. Um, that's less common, but that can happen. Um, they um, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish this from an infection or inflammation in the GI tract, making the diagnosis quite complicated. Um, and then um, when the diagnosis is made, we usually use chemotherapy similar to other forms of purple T cell lymphoma. And then we consider um, doing following that up with other chemotherapy and even a stem cell transplant from your own cells. Um, and there's more and more data about the genomics and the biology of these two diseases being different from each other. Um, and and, and but has not yet led to changes in the way we treat these patients. Medal is in the family of more cytotoxic or in the family of gamma delta T cell lymphomas as well as hepatosplenic and um, cutaneous gamma delta. So what are gamma delta T cell lymphomas? Um, um, we have all the T cells that you have have uh, something called a T cell receptor and that's the barcode of the of the T cell to help um, detect um, to to tell it which antigens or which things it's looking out for to help ward those um, invaders out. Um, and each, um, each T cell receptor has four different components. It has an alpha, a beta, a gamma, and a delta chain. And um, each T cell, as it figures out which, um, is it writes the recipe of which antigens it's going to be looking out for, which things it's looking out for to, to survey against. Um, it rearranges the sequence of its genes in these um, in these chains, in the T cell receptor chains. And so the there's some, uh, so you can have T cells that, ha that have gamma delta chains, that's normal, but then you have overexpression of the proteins gamma and delta as well. And, um, and those gamma delta T cell lymphomas that are predominantly based on the gamma delta receptors um, are, um, can, those, those lymphomas derived from those cells can be gamma delta T cell lymphomas. Gamma delta T cell lymphomas, there are some lymphomas that are classic to that. Um, so we mentioned that was one T cell lymphoma or cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma. Um, but then there are other um, T cell lymphomas that can also express gamma delta. So peripheral T cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified, metal, uh, the skin lymphoma mycosis from goides, or certain forms of um, LGL or large granular lymphocytic leukemia um, can also have gamma delta features on them. And so um, the diagnosis of these diseases, as you um, can probably tell, can be a little bit confusing. Um, 
And so um, referral for, for suspicious cases of this, it makes sense to get pathology referred in an expert medical center. So some of these um, develop into um, hepato, some of one type of gamma delta T cell lymphoma is hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma. So hepatic splenic T cell lymphoma um, has been associated with people who have had inflammatory bowel disease, who've been on certain immunosuppressive medicines. Um, and um, most of these then patients are as a result of that young men. Um, the um, They tend to be faster growing and tend to be relatively aggressive and um, from when people felt normal to sick. Um, they, these patients usually will have a large spleen and an enlarged liver and abnormal blood counts um, because it lives in the spleen, the liver, and the bone marrow. Uh, and it can be associated with that inflammatory disorder, HLH, that we were mentioning before, where the blood counts drop as a result of the, in, the infection fighting cells eating up the normal bone marrow cells. The treatment is, is for the purpose of cure. Um, and um, the goal is usually to treat cure um, very quickly with chemo with combination chemotherapy regimens. And when patients are in remission, we tend to take these patients to a donor bone marrow transplant because um, those are the patients who tend to do best. A different um, a different type of uh, gamma delta T cell lymphoma is cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma. This, like subcutaneous paniculitis, like T cell lymphoma, forms um, underneath the skin near the fat lobules um, as well and can show up with bumps underneath the skin. Um, and therefore, it can be sometimes hard to distinguish between subcutaneous paniculitis like T cell lymphoma and cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphoma. Um, however, um, the management of these patients is quite different. Patients with cutaneous gamma delta T cell lymphomas can develop large ulcerations. They tend to have fevers. They can develop low blood counts on that HLH-like phenomenon. Um, <laughs> they're often treated with intensive chemo with chemotherapy that leads to a donor bone marrow transplant. And so um, these patients, because they're managed quite differently, but their initial presentation can mimic subcutaneous paniculitis like T-cell lymphoma, it's important for these patients also to undergo an expert pathology review. Switching gears to NK T-cell lymphomas. Um, NK T-cell lymphomas um, come from a different group of T-cells entirely called the natural killer cells. These um, tend to be associated with the monovirus. In fact, you can find evidence of the monovirus in the cells of the NK T-cell lymphomas. Most patients will present with masses in the mouth um, or in the nose or in the back of the throat. Um, we call that the nasopharyngeal space. And it's uh, big, in areas where there's more in, what we call endemic EBV and, and chronic EBV, it's a little bit more common. So it's more common in Asia or Central and South America. In fact, um, whereas in the United States, NKT cell lymphomas make up less than 5% of, of uh, T cell lymphomas, in um, Asia, they make up uh, over almost a, a 20 to 25% of all T cell lymphomas. Now, patients can present with recurrent sores or ulcers or tumors in the mouth. Um, they're less common in the sinuses, the tonsil, or the back of the mouth. Um, but patients can develop disease in the skin or outside of the nasopharynx or outside of the head and neck. Um, they can also develop disease in the um, gastrointestinal tract, the liver, the testis, and other areas as well. Uh, we usually treat these patients for the purpose of cure as well. Um, they're often treated with chemotherapy, but it's important that that chemotherapy in, includes a drug called asparaginase for people who can tolerate that. Um, and um, that's unique to this T cell lymphoma. Um, but we know that these lymphomas can be very sensitive to radiation. So many patients are getting chemotherapy with radiation in the course of their treatment. And for patients for whom this lymphoma comes back, there has been uh, promising evidence that drugs to boost the immune system to fight the cancer or checkpoint inhibitors may be very effective. So in rare um, and um, NK and T cell lymphomas, I think it illustrates that um, that each of these diseases, while, while um, grouped under T cell lymphomas, is really biologically quite different and clinically quite different, and as a result, requires a different approach than our common approach for other T cell lymphomas. And um, as a result of them being very rare and the management varying very much based on what the disease is, um, review by an expert pathologist makes a lot of sense. Um, and ideally, expert opinion is recommended for patients who can access that. Um, as many um, community practitioners or uh, smaller centers may not have any much, have very little experience with these diseases. And it's, uh, as a result, as in the research community, we work very hard to collaborate 
um, to share experiences, share cases, but then also publish those cases and experiences so that we can increase the pool of knowledge about these rare and sometimes difficult to treat diseases. And working together, uh, we're hoping that we can understand them better and make a bigger difference for patients in the future. Um, there are lots of efforts to understand the biology of these diseases and to learn for better ways to treat them. Some of these include doing, um, uh, doing a project with the National Cancer Institute to sequence um, the genomics or understand the genomics mix of over 500 cases of purple T cell lymphomas. That includes these rarer types as well. Um, there are banking programs that are looking at looking for um, correlates in the blood as well. Um, and then I would say, you know, carefully designed clinical trials that include biopsies and thoughtful correlatives or laboratory science associated with them have been incredibly helpful because some of those patients who have these rare diseases on clinical trials have informed the landscape or future development of drugs for rare diseases as well. And so what can you do to advocate for yourself? I think being here is a big part of it. Um, you know, the Lymphoma Research Foundation has fantastic resources for patients and does a terrific job for advocacy for rare diseases, including these rare T cell lymphomas. I think talking to other people about your lymphoma journey is important, uh, whether they end up having lymphoma or not. Um, un understanding, helping people understand um, how um, people can deal with rarer diseases and uh, being open to talking about it is much is very helpful and realizing how um, lots of people who have different rare diseases actually encompass a lot of people together and how impactful research in, in rare diseases is. Um, consider clinical trials because I think um, those clinical trials can be highly informative um, to help people in the future and help to better understand the biology of these rare diseases. Um, and supporting research and advocacy um, is, is very important as well. Um, uh, with that, um, I'm open to questions. I thank um, Steve Horowitz for some help um, as we, I borrowed a few of his slides um, and, um, and all of you for your attention. Um, thank you.